You're listening to a programme from BBC Radio 4. Things have a beginning and a middle and an end and they have chains of consequence. The great religious stories are about literally the opposite of that. So you believe in Adam and Eve and you think that as a result of that we're all damned? Ugh. It so inhibits the love of God. What's your position on polygamy? I've read in the papers. It's a women's choice. Women Again, polygamy is want. not about women's Just choice, like it's many. about men's choice. No one had touched her, even to pat her on the back, since her diagnosis four years earlier. So I just asked her one question. I said, would you mind if I just hold your hand? It's the title of the program we're on, Beyond Belief. I mean, really, this is Beyond Belief. I'm Ernie Ray, and this is the Beyond Belief podcast. Today we're discussing Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad. She's often referred to as the first Muslim. She was certainly a dominant influence in the Prophet's life. She was a wealthy businesswoman and considerably older than him, and he remained faithful to her right up to her death. How great was her influence on the early development of Islam? Joining me are academics Mona Siddiqui and Rani Hafaz, Fatima Barkatullah, who's written a children's book about Khadija, and the Imam Asad Zaman. I began by asking Fatima what Khadija means to her. To me, Khadija is a role model. She's inspiring to anyone who has a cause that they want to support beyond themselves. And she's very much the mother of the believers, somebody who I look up to in in every area of life. Asad, what does she mean to you? Well, until recently, she was just the first wife of the Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. But as I've really researched into her more recently... She is the most amazing woman that I've ever read about. Mona, what does she mean to you? Well, I grew up listening to stories of the Prophet, and when it came to discussing the Prophet himself, he was always mentioned in conjunction with Khadija. So I never saw the two as inseparable. And Rania? Um, A strong, intelligent woman who, also independent, who was aware of her own agency and had a worldview and of, of her own impact locally and regionally and actually sought to make a difference in the world. Mona, how much do we actually know about her? Well, most of the information we have on the life of the Prophet comes down to us in the biographical literature, the Sira literature. And as you can imagine, a lot of the Sira literature was written decades after the Prophet's death. But tradition has it that she was born in Mecca in the mid-6th century. She was born into an affluent household in the tribe of Quraysh. Her father was a prosperous businessman, and he actually died fighting in a battle. She married twice, and the first husband died. The second time she married, the marriage was dissolved, or she separated because of incompatibility. And she basically then managed her own business that was left to her, and tradition has it that she really grew up in the lap of luxury. And that what we know of her in relation to the Prophet is that in managing her business, she had come to hear of the Prophet and his integrity and his ways and his kindness and uh, sent a slave girl to inquire after him. And that's really the kind of beginnings of uh, not only her life, but also the, the major events that led her to the Prophet. It's all a bit uncertain, though. This is tradition and much of it was written down a long time after her death. Absolutely, and and that's one of the fundamental challenges you face. But historians do compare and contrast different versions of biographies. And from these comparisons, you actually see emerging certain things that people can say, actually, that's probably true or that could have happened. So, Fatima, when you sat down to write a book about Khadija, how did you piece together all these bits from the material? I think one of the main sources that I used was actually the books of Hadith. That's so the traditions of the Prophet. Yeah, the traditions, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And uh, one of the key narrators, ironically, was Aisha, who was you know, a later wife of the Prophet, whom obviously the Prophet had told the story of Khadija to, and then she was narrating you know, what happened at the beginning of Revelation when he first became a Prophet. And this was something that Aisha, she wasn't actually witness to, but she uh, very faithfully and seeing it as a duty conveyed to the Muslims. So I actually didn't find it very difficult to find information about, you know, the revelation side of Khadija's connection with the Prophet. 
The areas that were more difficult was reading, I think, between the lines when it came to the difficulties that Khadija must have faced. Because every time you're reading the seerah, every time you're reading the biography of the Prophet, she's there, especially in the Meccan period. She's there in the background alongside him doing whatever it is that she needed to do. Well, also, also I'm, I'm, I'm a sociologist, not a historian. So for me, it's actually about understanding this, the conditions of the times. And actually, it's, it's the fact that there's a monogamous marriage at a time when most people would have had several wives, especially if they had a high standing. Very polygamous society. Extreme, exceedingly polygamous society. The fact that we know that she was older than him and we know that she initiated the marriage. She actually asked him to marry her. So that actually shows her as somebody who stood almost challenging the social norms. Uh, Asad, how unusual would it have been for a woman to have been involved in business in Arabia at that time? Very unusual indeed. Um, I mean, she literally smashed the glass ceiling. Even women today would aspire to do what she did 1,400 years ago. You know, she was a multimillionaire, extremely eligible for marriage. She refused so many men of nobility. She was of an extremely high nobility herself. And therefore, for her to pick the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, she must have seen some amazing qualities in him that made her change her mind about marriage. And, and Rani, it's all the more remarkable because conditions that you've mentioned for women in yes. Arabia at that time were pretty appalling. You know, daughters who were born yes. were very often uh, put yes. out in the hillside. Absolutely. Daughters were actually um, sometimes murdered because they, they were worried about poverty and honour. But we have to remember that uh, class is always a factor. And the fact that she came from an upper class. So yes, uh, she did break a lot of the kind of uh, stereotypes of women at the time. But it was really good that she actually had agency. She knew how to use her power, her position, her class position, her wealth, to make real changes and to propose something completely different. Uh, Mona, why do you think she chose Muhammad? She had heard of his integrity and honesty and that, you know, he was a man of principal behaviour and she was looking for someone to head her trading caravans. And he accepted the offer and started working for her. But even then, she, she wanted to make sure that he was good, that, you know, he was what she had heard about him. So there is a tradition that she sent a trusted slave to actually accompany him and serve him and see what he was like. This slave then came back and basically reported that there were miraculous things going on around the prophets. And for Khadija then, that kind of confirmed that, yes, he was the right man. Fatima. I think even before she met the Prophet Muhammad, we have to understand Khadija's family was very inclined towards monotheism. Um, I wanted to say, um, <coughs> kind of almost in response to Mona as well, and to Fatima, that actually we're thinking of her as a Muslim woman, but a lot of her character was formed before the message of Islam came. So we're in danger of back reading into Absolutely. it, something that fits. And that's my, my, my uh, comment about the class, was that she was able to use her class position to make changes, to actually be slightly different, maybe not unique. But the fact is we do not have a lot of contemporary evidence on the women of the region or even the men. It's only a uh, hundred years later, as we look back on Islam, that we, we delve into these stories. But it's important to see her, uh, to me, not just as somebody formed by Islam, but somebody who was crucial to the, the looking after Islam as a little sapling of growing Islam with the Prophet, peace be upon him. I think it's really important to just, just to re-emphasize that. I would be wary of saying that she was inherently monotheistic because we're now kind of imposing an Islam on her post-Islam. Mm -hmm. I think that what little information we have on her is really about her relationship to the Prophet, but also her relationship with her family and as a businesswoman. The fact that she comforted him and that she and she became the first convert is really in alliance with the Prophet, is really what her response was to the Prophet, rather than something intrinsically responding to the call of monotheism. Just tell me, Asad, about the marriage. It, it, it was really very unusual for a man to be monogamous for a period of 25 years at that time in Arabia. And to me, that tells me the level of love that existed between 
husband and wife, between the Prophet Muhammad and Khadija. Although it started off as a trading relationship. It started off as... Um, as an employer-employee uh, uh, relationship. Exactly. He was her employee. The other interesting thing, though, is the age difference. No, and yes. I, I, I know there's a dispute mm. about what age she was, because she, it, it's, it's said she that was, they married yeah. at, 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 when she was 40, and, and they then had 25. six children, which yes. sounds a little improbable. Uh, there are different stories about that, actually. And there's uh, some um, kind of uh, stories put her as younger than 40, but she had children also before him. It must have been quite difficult at times for her, though, Fatima, because there was a period when he went off rather a lot on his own, left her behind, went off to meditate or to think or whatever you like to call it. But there were periods of separation in the marriage. Yeah, it seems that she very deeply understood his need to go away from the city, to contemplate and to spend time with God and, and, and to connect with God. It seems that she really understood that because it was Khadija who actually used to take the food and travel up the mountain. And anyone who's been up that mountain, I've been up the mountain, it's like a two-hour walk. Um, and obviously it would have been very difficult and, and rocky, and she would take food to him to allow him to spend more time there. So that kind of shows you there was this affinity between them and understanding that, you know, uh, something was going to happen. And I think between the the marriage and the receiving the prophethood, a certain very intense spiritual, not just physical relationship, had developed to uh, such an extent that she really understood his needs in a way that an average woman probably wouldn't understand. And therefore, when he came back, after this horrific experience that he had. This was the experience of Jibril, Gabriel, coming to him, him. and revealing the message. Exactly. And, and he didn't take it well at first. He was yeah. absolutely <laughs> frightened. I he mean, was that petrified, is, actually. He, he was. And so, you know, it, it must have taken him over an hour to get back home, and he was still shivering. And he was saying, you know, I, I think I'm going crazy. I, I just saw, saw this, and I'm going mad. And, of course, she said to him, and this is where she becomes mm -hmm. really the rock that she was right up to the end, that, you know, God Almighty will never abandon you. You're so kind to everyone. You look after the orphans. Uh, you look after the needy. And let's go to my cousin, Waraka, I mean, no Phil, and perhaps he can help us uh, along this because this is clearly something out of our experience. And that's where Waraka bin Nofil then says to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that this experience that you just described is the angel Gabriel. You are the chosen one. You are going to be the prophet that has been prophesied. Uh, Fatima, she's known as the first Muslim. What do we mean by that? When the prophet Muhammad came with the message and you know, um, she became aware of his prophethood that she accepted him immediately. She was the first. She was the first, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Waraka bin Nofal is actually considered to be the first man um, who became a Muslim, but he died very soon afterwards. So the thing is that when Waraka told them that, you know, your people are going to turn you out of this city, this was a prophecy, Mecca. yeah. You know, Muhammad and Khadija must have been beside themselves because they were from the nobility. They were a very loved family. They were a very popular family. And to hear from Waraka that actually trouble was going to be ahead, you know, uh, must have been very worrying for them. Um, and the Prophet asked Waraka, are they really going to expel me from this city? And he said, anyone who came with a message like yours has always been persecuted. Uh, Rani, let's just put this in, in context, yeah. because what happened? Uh, Mecca was a city that depended on idols. Lots of people came there. There was pilgrimages. Well, Mecca was a city trade. that depended on trade, and idols were a way of um, showing everybody who came from different parts that you have a place here. So the idols were really rep representing of the various tribes around Mecca and around Arabia, so they could all come to the, to the house. And they had the Hajj, the pilgrimage, to the house. But basically, Mecca de depended on trade. You know, this this is a, a city also based on slavery. It's a city based on the rich exploiting the poor, essentially. And then you had these 
two wealthy couple who are monogamous, who have kind of have been almost the ideal family, who are proposing to turn everything upside down. Turning it upside down by saying, actually, all these idols are nothing. There is one Not God, just and you've idols. got to get rid of the idols. Yeah, I think we, when we look at the idols, Islam, of course, of course, is a monotheistic religion. It wasn't just about idols. The, the, the essence of the, the, the message of the Prophet was justice, and it was social justice. And there was this companion of his, his partner, who had put her money where both their mouths were and actually had given a lot to charity to support others, and they were about to actually start revolutionizing Mecca. Awesome. And just to pick up on that point of revolutionizing Mecca, uh, one of the primary reasons why the, the non-Muslim Meccans, the polytheists, especially people like Abu Jahl and, and those who were in prominent positions and extremely wealthy, they opposed the message of there is only one God because the entire economic system of Mecca was based on polytheism. And if you were to get rid of polytheism, the entire economic system would collapse and these very wealthy people and privileged people, their source of income would go with it. So, so basically what happened was when they were in Mecca, still in Mecca. They were being persecuted. They, uh, the Muslim shops were being boycotted. They were finding it very difficult to, to keep going. And basically, Mona, during that time, Khadija bankrolled them. She financed the movement. She did, but I'd be wary of... I mean, I think it's very difficult to, to separate this sociological from the historical because I think one of the things is that if you look at the Qur'an, the Qur'an has actually very little biographical information on the prophets. And if you look at the Meccan surahs, they're very largely concerned with don't raise him into something he isn't. Now, you know, I'm paraphrasing here. He's a warner. He has come to you with a message. And then later on, by the time we get to the Medinan uh, verses, the Qur'an starts to... Um, uh, elevate the prophet into something much bigger. So you have verses like obey God and obey his messenger as if the two are almost synonymous. And so I think we have to be a little bit careful as to what was her role in terms of revolutionizing. I think it is probably without doubt based on the sources we have that she supported him financially, she supported him emotionally and psychologically. There was a deep love and affection between them. But she, she was prepared to do that. She was prepared to do that because she believed in him and she believed in what he was trying to do, which I'm not sure at the time was a revolution, but it was certainly a new way of thinking about both God and justice. Because well, it must be said that she wasn't actually there for the big moment, the move from Mecca to Medina. She had died before that happened. So I, I wonder, within that context, how big was her role in shaping the form of early Islam, Fatima? I think the Prophet Muhammad's words say it all. You know, at one point later on in Medina, when um, one of his wives got uh, quite jealous, and uh, this was Aisha. It was, yes, Aisha, and she said, "You know, why do you keep remembering this lady?" And and you know, I think she said, "Old, old woman, lady right? with no teeth." <laughs> this <said>. lady, <laughs> and uh, when God has given you a wife who's better than her, okay, so her natural kind of sense of jealousy came out. The Prophet Muhammad actually rebuked her and said to her, no, God has not given me a wife better than her. She supported me when everyone rejected me. She gave me wealth when everybody else prevented me from wealth. And God gave me children uh, through her. So I think, you know, it's not just about what the Quran says about this story. We do base, uh, you know, a lot of it on the hadith and the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. It's, it's just that if we're, if we're forming a, a kind of... All I'm saying is that we can't really form any consistent biography. We can say there are some things that are consistent. But, you know, if you're looking for historical truth, it's actually quite difficult. It's, mu it's So much of it is really about what the believer believes and wants to believe. But there was a period, Ernie, when um, the Muslims were actually completely boycotted. They were made homeless, and this was three years... And they lived was, in tents. They lived, they lived in tents. They, they, nobody was allowed to buy from them or sell to them or marry them. It was a complete economic and social boycott. And during that time, we know that it was Khadija's wealth that would have sustained them, you know. Um, and also um, the fact that after this period, Khadija actually passed away very soon afterwards. So she went through all of that suffering and as you said she didn't see the the fruits of her efforts in in that sense but i think in that is is kind of inspiration i think for our times fatima what does she stand for today i think today she is inspiration for anyone who is part of a movement or anyone who's part of a cause greater than themselves and might be sacrificing and working hard for that movement in that 
uh, you might not see the fruits of your efforts within your lifetime, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth making those efforts. Mona? I suppose to some extent she stands for something that is very contested in many Muslim communities, which is that how do, do women exercise personal autonomy, moral agency, decision-making without fear? And she, from, from the information we have on her, she seemed to have done that extraordinarily well. See, I'm interested in this, Assad, because here we're saying that this was a remarkable role, role model. You would expect that, that looking at her, Muslims would treat women all around the world with great veneration and respect. And yet we all know that there are certain countries in which women walk four paces behind the men, they're not allowed to drive cars, they're treated as chattels. How do you account for that? You know, Annie, when I started reading up on the role of Khadija, the kind of person she was, the influence of her on the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I was forced to change so much of my thinking towards women, towards my own wife, when I thought, my God, there's so much in, in my mind and the way, my attitude that is fashioned by the culture in which I've been brought up in, which is not necessarily purely influenced by Islam, that we really need to get this out to the masses, that we need to change our attitude to women and to really not be intimidated by somebody who is richer than us, perhaps more intelligent, perhaps... Um, it certainly has a higher status. You know, all of these are part and parcel of the culture in which we are brought up in. And I think by studying her life, we can change the mindset of the male population. M Mona, what, what do you make of this contrast between the person of Khadija, greatly venerated within the Muslim world, and the fact that women in many cultures are treated so badly in the Muslim world? Well, I think one of the problems of with all respect to all the Prophet's wives, and, you know, you can read them as figures who, who were intrinsic to the Prophet's life and their legacies. But when, when a lot of people look back, and especially Muslim men and Muslim male scholars look back and say, you know, these were the wives, these were the mothers of the believers, they had virtue, etc., etc., they're almost dis distancing these wives into something that has no bearing on their own relationship with women. And I, I find that a real challenge because, obviously, the, the issues, the problems, the challenges gender relations face today, including in Muslim societies, are not quite the same in some ways as they were, you know, 1400 years ago. So it's not simply about I have to look at these figures and now change my, my attitude to women. It's how do you face the constant daily challenges um, that that arise simply out of women wanting some personal agency, women wanting the respect, women not having not, not having to wait for you to quote something from the Hadith or the Quran, but actually saying, look, you know, we are equals here. This, these are rights we've been given. Fatima? I don't think that the lives of the Prophet's wives um, themselves actually gave women, um, you know, more rights. I think intrinsically Islam did give women in Arabia many more rights and uh, freed them from many of the things, many of the oppressions that they were exposed to before. For example, female infanticide was wiped out of Arabia, you know, because of Islam. Um, however, I think in our times, we're seeing a lot of ignorance. We're seeing, uh, you know, a, a lack of education as well, you know, in many places in the Muslim world. I'm part of um, a seminary where female scholars are being trained. And I think that will go some way towards the, the spotlight being put on in certain areas that perhaps have been ignored, um, you know, um, in the past. Asad? The, the way I see this, and the point I was trying to make really was that there is Islam and there is culture. And when you start to study the lives of the, the life of the Prophet, uh, the Seerah, and how he treated his wives, you find you are better able to separate the religion from the culture. As you said quite rightly, there are uh, areas within the Muslim world where women are not treated as they ought to be. They are not given the rights that Islam gave them 1,400 years ago, and they are treated in, in a more subordinate manner, which is completely unacceptable. Um, the problem is that there is no religion outside of culture. There is no Islam yeah. outside of a cultural context. Well, I don't well, agree can, with that. Can I, add to, can I add a third thing to the mix? Um, 
uh, I think it's, it's religion, it's culture, but it's also uh, economic circumstances, socioeconomic circumstances. I think you will find, you know, I travel a lot in the Arab world, where you have, um, you know, people who have access to wealth and um, higher position in society always ha have more choices. But what we can do in, in looking back is, is people, not just Khadija, and also she was a woman of her own class, but other women around the, the story of Islam. And actually the first martyr in Islam was a woman, but she was a woman who was a slave. And actually that tells us about uh, female, well, individual agency, female and male. And it, basically it is about the dialectic. It's about actually looking at principles, not just the detail. I'm looking at the principles of justice, of independence, of equity and equality and, and fighting for those, but realizing that gender relationships will always be problematic. Asad, you were objecting to, to Mona's assertion that you can't separate religion and culture. Well, okay. The point I'm trying to make is that, for example, take one example of forced marriage. Now, we hear about it constantly on the news uh, about certain you know, cultures encouraging and, and being part of uh, this really quite cruel uh, aspect of marriage, forcing children to marry somebody against their will. But forced marriage is not part of our faith. And that's what I'm saying that once, and as we've seen with the life of Khadija, she proposed to the Prophet Muhammad, a peace prophet, she chose him. And therefore, the principles which are there within Islam, we are not applying them uh, within many aspects of our culture and our thinking because we, we, unfortunately, those who are not educated within the faith do mix culture and religion and frequently they are unjust to their wives or children because of their ignorance of basic Islamic values. Mona. I mean, basically, though, with respect to Khadija, she proposed to him not as a Muslim. You have to bear that in yeah. mind. And there's a lot of scholarship debating whether, despite the Quran giving Muslim women rights, were, were women, did women have more rights prior to Islam? Um, and again, there could be class issues here as well. But did women have more rights, however you conceptualise rights, before Islam or afterwards? And I think that it's very easy, and it becomes very easy for Muslims to say that the Quran gave us these rights, Islam gave us these rights. But we've been having these discussions for decades. And in many parts of the Islamic world, very little has changed. And the reason why very little has changed is precisely because people don't just say this is culture. They actually quote religious sources to say, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I want to ask each one of you a final question as we draw this programme to an end. Asad, if you were to meet Khadija, what would you say to her? What was it that convinced you that this man is someone that you are going to commit your entire life to and stand by your man, whatever the circumstances? Fatima. I would give her a copy of my book all about her <laughs> and I would say, uh, dear Khadija, please tell me your story in your own words. But I would also say to her, your efforts paid off, you know, because I think we are part of her legacy, the very existence of Muslims all over the world. Mona? I think I would just ask her, what do you think of Aisha? Good one. <laughs> Rania? I think Mona wins with, with this one, actually. Uh, no, I, I would actually ask her what gave her the courage to ask somebody below her status, uh, younger than her, for marriage. What was it in her mind? And how she stood up to her society at the time. Well, there we must leave the story of Khadija. My thanks to Mona Siddiqui, Asad Zaman, Rania Hafez and Fatima Barkatullah. I'll be back again next Monday with another edition of Beyond Belief. I hope you'll join me. You can download many more BBC Radio 4 programmes for free. Find these at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.